This is setting up a virtual terminal server through which I gain access to the logical domains once they're created using Telnet. And I define the range of ports that I use to access the systems. And here's an example. Telnet localhost 5000. So here I'm on my control domain. The same machine I'm on here. Well, and I want to talk to my first logical domain, which is given the ID of uh, the uh, Telnet port of 5000. So I say Telnet localhost, the localhost, and then the port number. Uh, if I come back to this window, and you're thinking, how would I know what the port is? I can do things like an LDM list. And here I've got a domain called HPF1, and the console is port 5000. So I can see quite clearly what port to access. And having accessed the port, I've got into the OK prompt of that virtual machine. And I can run all the normal commands that you would expect uh, at that particular juncture. Print the banner. The MAC address, uh, I can actually assign the MAC address. Uh, but the, the LDM software assigns uh, a, a MAC address for me. Okay. I can do things like show disks and have a look at the actual disk drives. One of them would be the operating system disk. Uh, and the other disk there, A, is the DVD, from which I, I'll show you how to assign a DVD uh, of the Solaris image in order to be able to build the machine without using the network. So all the usual commands are available. Um, here I'm adding a virtual switch. So the logical domains software has some very powerful facilities. Okay. So I'm creating a virtual switch through which the logical domains can communicate within the physical machine and which itself can also communicate with the outside world. And here I'm saying the actual physical port on the system that I want to be used uh, for that virtual switch to talk to the outside world. Okay. And as I'm uh, configuring all these things, I can uh, list the services as we go along. LDF list hyphen services to keep a track of what's going on. Obviously the list gets bigger uh, the more work that I do. As well as configuring services, I also need to configure the actual physical resources that the control domain is going to use, so that I have some, that rather than using them all, which is the default when you build it, I can actually uh, trim down the resources that the control domain is going to use. So, uh, again, I did cover this in the last webinar, but in case you've not seen that, here I'm setting uh, a mathematical unit, okay, assigning one unit uh, in this particular machine, there's a mathematical unit per core of eight, of eight threads. So I'm setting one mathematical unit and then eight virtual CPUs, which is equivalent to one core. And in fact, I can assign cores as well. Here I'm assigning memory, but I have to do this in a special way with the control domain because the LDM software uh, may complain about the fact that I'm changing the configuration of the uh, control domain. So I have to delay the reconfiguration until I reboot the control domain. So that's why this command is run. LDM start reconf primary says any changes I'm now going to make, please delay them until I reboot the machine and then everything will work nicely instead of getting error messages. So. Uh, assigning two gigs of memory. The control domain is only going to be a control domain. I'm not going to run any applications, therefore I don't need a lot of resource. And in any case, I can dynamically change the amount of memory as I'm running, which is another great feature of logical domains. And then I would reboot my domain, and then I can see if I come back to the domain, I can do LDM list bindings, the name of the domain, and I can check to see that the resources are as I expected. I can see a little summary at the top, 2 gigs of RAM, 
eight virtual CPUs. And then if I look through the listing that accompanies that, you can see the, there's the uh, mathematical unit. Things like uh, whether the what the boot device is, etc. And the I/O devices. Uh, it's possible to split depending on the nature of the hardware. I could split PCI buses across different domains, but that's for another webinar a little bit later in the future. So the control domain is now set up with its resources. I have to enable the virtual network terminal service daemon to allow me access to the, the port, like I did here with the uh, five telemetting to port 5000. And then I can start thinking about guest domains. So I'd need to know, before I start creating guest domains, uh, because I haven't created any, I'd obviously know pretty well what resources I had, but I could do LDM list devices, which would show me basically what I've got left, what's free at any given time. So I've got a, a few cores left. A few mathematical units. Okay. If you're wondering where the others went, uh, I've actually already created a, a domain with HPF1, which we'll be looking at shortly. Okay. So we're going to now look at uh, creating the domains, assigning resources, uh, binding it, which is basically then assigning all the resources from the control domain and then getting the domain started and installing uh, the Solaris operating system within it. Now, uh, just to let you know a little bit more about the capability of the T-Series server, uh, there's a lot of um, extra facilities that I haven't mentioned, um, especially with the more recent T-Series servers like the T3s and 4s. Um, it's quite common to create uh, domains through which you can split the input output from the machine. Um, and then you can create failover of devices uh, like a PCI bus that maybe has an HPA card configured within it. So you can then uh, create multi-pathing of disk to your SAN or whatever devices you're using. Uh, and then if one of the domains goes down through some operating system fault, which obviously is unlikely, but you know, covering all angles, uh, the other domain uh, will automatically uh, then be used for the I/O path of the disk. Okay, and which is what we've done on this T3 server that I've uh, been talking about. Okay. So some fairly complex um, configurations are possible. Okay, this particular server runs a control domain, another domain that is used just to handle uh, failover of I/O and balancing. Um, uh, and it has six guest domains, each of which is running a fairly substantial Oracle database with, uh, I think the system has got 256 processors altogether and a vast amount of memory. Uh, and the nice thing is, uh, if, you, you know, if you consider the tuning of these things a little bit down the line and you find that one of the systems is using a bit more processor power than some of the others, you can dynamically allocate uh, processors to that system and remove them from something else. And you can even now, with the latest version of the logical domain software, do the same thing with the, the system memory. Now, in this particular case, with this T3, uh, that scale builders are configuring and, and looking after, uh, each guest domain also, as well as having disk multipathing, uses Solaris IPMP through two different domains. Okay? So that each one has a couple of network interfaces, one of each of which is configured in the separate I.O. domains. So again, if there's an I.O. domain failure or a control domain failure, not only do the disk uh, paths fail over, that's also true of the networking. In fact, uh, you can split the PCI bus between machines and you can split individual PCI slots between machines. De again, depending a little bit on the hardware. 
that's not always guaranteed, but the T32 certainly has that capability.